acceptance ceremony was given to him by the God of the Bible. But Dr. Durham admits that the Masonic initiation ceremony was the immediate inspiration of the Mormon endowment ceremony. But the official position of the Mormons was stated by Elder Heber C. Kimball, who had been a Mason since 1823, seven years prior to the founding of the Mormon religion. He wrote, Masonry had been taken from the priesthood. If Elder Kimball meant that the Mason Masonic ritual had been taken from the Mormon endowment ceremony, he is dramatically wrong. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Remember that the Masonic ritual was first made public in America in a nationwide scandal in 1826, some 16 years before the endowment ceremony was written down. So it is very clear that Mormonism took the endowment ceremony from the Masonic Lodge. But the Mormons claim that Joseph Smith received the ceremony from a direct revelation of God. Bruce C. McConkie, Bruce R. McConkie, one of the first council of the 70, says the ordinances performed in the temple were given in modern times to Prophet Joseph Smith by revelation. And Joseph Smith died because he had stolen the secret initiation ceremony of the Masons and therefore had violated the oath he had taken as a Mason. Now this is another source of knowledge about the shooting of Joseph Smith. This is a report by M Mervyn B. Hogan of the University of Utah entitled Freemasonry and the Lynching at Carthage Jail. Joseph Smith was not hanged, he was shot. So it is assumed that the good professor is talking about the shooting of Joseph Smith. In this book, Mr. Hogan states that the evidence proves that Joseph Smith was shot by the Masons. He claims that the Mormons, in anger because of the death of Joseph Smith, wrote this oath, which has been called the Oath of Vengeance, into the endowment ceremony. It reads as follows. You and each of you do covenant and promise that you will pray and never cease to pray, Almighty God, to avenge the blood of the prophets under this nation and that you will teach the same to your children unto the third and fourth generation. That means that those who took this oath inside the endowment ceremony pledged to avenge the death of Hiram and Joseph Smith against the government of the United States when they knew it was the Masons who killed their leaders. This oath was removed sometime around 1927, so for some 73 years, all endowed Mormons took an oath against innocent people. It is believed that Ezra Taft Benson, the current prophet of the Mormon Church, took this oath prior to its removal in 1927. Those who study the Mormon Church claim that he has never publicly repudiated the oath. But there are other connections between Mormonism and Masonry, and some of these can be found at the Mormon Temple in Salt Lake City. This is a book that I found in the Mormon bookstore here in Tucson. It is called Celestial Symbols and was written by Alan H. Harmer, apparently a member of the Mormon Church. It talks about the main temple of the Mormons at Salt Lake City. Construction on this temple was started in 1853 and completed in 1893. It is important to mention that Brigham Young, the prophet who succeeded Joseph Smith after he was murdered, claimed that he got the design of the temple from a revelation of God. This is the entire temple showing one side and the front. I want you to notice that the temple has six, has six obelisks in total, three in front and three in back. Now this is a photograph that I took when I visited the temple in 1993. And this is a picture of one of the sides of the temple. I'm sorry it's a little bit dark, but uh, if you'll notice the use of the round circles, both in the windows and on the top of the columns, just to the left of each window, around 10 o'clock to each window. They're everywhere on the sides of the temple. This is a closer look at the use of the circular windows and the sun symbols on each side of the round window. So find the round window and look to the left about uh, uh, 9 or 10 o'clock, and you'll see a sun symbol radiating from the, uh, the round the, the circle there. And this is a close-up of those sun symbols with the rays emerging from the circle. So they've got sun symbols on the side of the church. This is a close-up of the sun symbols from the front of the temple. There you can see them a little more clearly. And this is a close-up of a star 
with one point down, also all over the sides of the temple. If you look very carefully in that little piece right up in the middle, there's a star there in concrete with one point down. You might remember that the Masons claim that when the star is shown with one point down, it represents the evil god, the goat of Mendes, or Baphomet. And these stars with one point down are all over the Mormon temple. It is important to notice that the so-called Christian church, the Christian temple, here's a better close-up of it, I'm sorry, it's another picture of the star with one point down. It is important to notice that the so-called Christian temple of the Mormons has no crosses on it. It has suns and stars with one point down, but no crosses. It also has a big dipper on the front of the temple. And there you can see it with the handle off to the left and the big dipper up around 12 o'clock. This is a rather dark slide that I made myself on my visit to the temple. One might ask the Mormons what the Big Dipper has to do with the Bible. This is a slide taken of the tops of the obelisks in front of the temple. Notice that there are no crosses on any of the obelisks. And this is a close-up of the top of the center obelisk. I didn't take this picture. It was in Mr. Harmer's book. And this is the statue of the angel Moroni on the top of the temple. The Mormons believe that the angel Moroni appeared to Joseph Smith and told him about the gold plate from which the Book of Mormon was allegedly translated. So he is more important to the Mormon church than is, Joseph, than is uh, Jesus Christ. Mr. Harmer, the author of the book, attempted to explain why there are no crosses on the temple. He said the Mormons have resisted the use of the cross as a symbol on their churches because it has become commercialized. He failed to point out that the star with one point down has been commercialized by the Eastern Star Order of the Masonic Lodge and by the Satanic Church of Anton LaVey. And this is a catalog from a company that sells Masonic paraphernalia, the McCoy Company, uh, the September 1991 edition. This is a page from that catalog that shows that the company is commercializing their upside down star and the square and the compass that both the Masons and the Mormons use in their religion. But as far as I know, the Mormons are not eliminating their use of these symbols. The Mormons have made two more of the Masonic symbols a part of their endowment ceremony. This is called a book, this is a book rather, entitled, What's Going On In There? And it contains an actual transcript of the entire Mormon endowment ceremony. This book was written by Chuck Sackett, a former Mormon and former, a former Mormon and a former endowment ceremony worker, meaning that he was one of the Mormons who was involved in the actual endowment ceremony. In this book, Mr. Sackett describes what the Mormons call the garment of the holy priesthood. Each endowed Mormon must wear this garment 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, until he or she is buried in it. Before I quote from Mr. Sackett's book, I would like to show you this slide again. These are, as you'll remember, the square and the compass, the two major symbols of the Masonic Order. Mr. Sackett continued, or reports rather, closer examination of the garment reveals a pair of buttonholes over the right breast sewn in the form of a square, meaning the square of the square and the compass of the Masons. Over the left breast, a pair of buttonholes in the form of a compass have been sewn in. So the endowed Mormon wears a garment with the two major symbols of the Masonic Order sewn in it, and we have been told that there is no connection between Masonry and Mormonism. Yes, the Masons are everywhere, in every religion, in every culture, in every time period. The Mormons use sun symbols on their older temples as well. This is a sunstone taken from a Mormon temple in Nauvoo, Illinois. It is currently at the Smithsonian Institute where it has been authenticated as coming from the Mormon temple. And I personally saw a full-size duplicate to this one in the Mormon Museum in Salt Lake City, Utah. Notice that it has a circle with the face on it with rays emanating from its center. It is obviously a representation of the sun. Secondly, notice that there is a base and three layers, and the sun is laying on the top of the third layer. It could be interpreted as meaning that one gets to the sun god through three degrees or three layers of the Masonic Order. But that is speculation and no one that I know has said that. There's one last thing I must talk about before I end this section on the Mormon Church and it concerns part of the endowment ceremony. Once again, 
As I said, this scene I'm about to discuss is recorded from the exact words of rec as recorded in Chuck Sackett's book, taken from a movie that all of the Mormons about to be endowed are viewing. Adam, the first man in the Bible, in the Garden of Eden, prays to the God of the Bible. He says, or he prays actually, O oh God, hear the words of my mouth. He's praying to the God of the Bible. And Lucifer, portrayed by an actor, responds, I hear you. Adam responds, Who are you? And Lucifer says, I am the God of this world. And then asks Adam, What do you want? And Adam responds, I am looking for messenger. Lucifer says messenger is meaning someone who's witnessed to him to tell him the truth about Christianity. And Lucifer says, oh, you, are, you want someone to preach to you. You want religion, do you? I will have preachers here presently. And then Lucifer provides Adam with a preacher. That means that Lucifer answers the prayer of Adam. Adam's prayer is to God, but Lucifer answers it. And this is in the endowment ceremony of the Mormon church. And there is one more thing that is extremely disturbing in the endowment ceremony relating to Lucifer. One of the scenes in the endowment ceremony is a scene with Lucifer, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. A man portraying Lucifer shows up wearing a, an apron around his middle. And Adam asks the devil, what is that apron you have on? And Lucifer answers, it is an emblem of my power and priesthood, plural. It is to remembered, be remembered that the Mormon going through the endowment ceremony is in the temple to become a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And Lucifer says that the apron is a symbol of his priesthood. And then Lucifer says to the character portraying Adam and Eve, the characters portraying Adam and Eve, who have just heard the God of the Bible come to the scene, Lucifer says, see, you are naked. Take some fig leaves and make you aprons. Quick, hide. And then the narrator in the play says to all the Mormons assembled in the room, who are going through the endowment ceremony, brethren and sisters, put on your aprons. And the movie stops while all the Mormons remove a bright green satin fig leaf embroidered apron from their packages of temple clothing given to them at the beginning of the endowment ceremony. And each of these endowed ceremony uh, Mormons ties the apron around their waist. Notice how strange it is that the Mormons put on their aprons right after Lucifer asked them to hide and right after the narrator stops the program and asks all of them to do so. Notice that Lucifer has just identified the apron as a symbol of his priesthood and yet the, the Mormons put on an apron as a symbol of their acceptance of a priesthood. And I am certain that the Mormons would certify that their apron is not Luciferian. But notice that it is Lucifer that orders them to put it on. Notice that it is both the Masons and the Mormons who wear aprons in their religious ceremonies. This is a picture of some Mormons wearing their aprons in their endowment ceremony. You'll see them on the two, uh, in fact, three of the members of the people in front of you. I believe the man with the glasses is Chuck Sackett, the man who wrote the endowment ceremony for this uh, book. So I think it is fair to conclude that the Mormons and the Masons are connected. Now uh, let me attempt to tie all of this together. These are the last two sections of this lecture. I'd like to start the final area of discussion with a little background information on President Ronald, former President Ronald Reagan. Uh, there was a very puzzling event involving this president 
He joined the Masons in February 1988 while he was president of the United States.